October is right around the corner, and we here at Tangents are getting ready for our annual Halloween blowout. For all of our new listeners, each October we pick a haunting theme and spend the whole month talking about topics related to that theme. Like one year, all of the hosts picked the thing that scared them the most. Uh, Another year, we did a bunch of monsters like vampires and zombies. This year, we're calling October Trick or Treat Month, and it's going to be an extra good one. But while we put the finishing touches on our month of tricks and treats, please enjoy this encore presentation of our eerie audio adventure through Tangents Manor, where we learned about the science of spooky sounds. See you next week. and will entertain you with tales from the SciShow Tangents crypts. I, Sari Riley, am your ghost host, and I'll be joined by the usual ghouls, Hank Green, Stefan Chin, and Sam Schultz, as we tantalize and torment your eardrums with some of the scariest sounds out there, and the science of what makes our skin crawl. Take a seat wherever you'd like. Oh, not the science couch. It's got some slime residue from our last guest. But please, Join us for our chat. Hello, friends. What is fear? It's what I'm feeling right now. <laughs> You're being too scary. There's a Sam-shaped hole in the wall. I ran out of the room. Fear is the emotion when uh, when something bad might happen. I, I guess I was thinking of it like maybe more specifically and like if you if you think that something might physically or emotionally harm you. But I think actually your definition is is broader and, and encapsulates more things that could probably be considered fear. Oh yeah, I definitely get scared of things that will not harm me. Like movies and uh, haunted houses and all kinds of stuff that aren't really scary, like objectively speaking. Uh, most of the things that I've been afraid of have not threatened my, my physical body. Mm-hmm. Is there a different types of fear or is all fear the same fear? Cause there is like test fear, but there is also like scary mm. movie fear. And I don't, I can't step back and see if those are the same feeling. Like they feel different to me. Like there's gut fear, maybe <laughs> heart fear, head fear, foot fear. <laughs> That is the same question that scientists ask. Some of them, they they equate fear and anxiety and like lump that under uh, the same umbrella. Yeah. But then depending on the particular study, some scientists qualify fear different than anxiety, where anxiety is the broader bubble mm. that incorporates all sort of like psychological, physiological, and behavioral, like fearful behaviors or fearful like feelings mm. and any sort of arousal in your autonomic nervous system, which is like your heart rate, digestion, breathing, fight or flight response. But then animal behavioralists tend to define fear as a specifically defensive behavior or escape. So, like, it's stimuli that leads to that behavior. Mm. Ah. But anxiety describes, like, a lot of the things that we would consider fear. I guess it almost feels like the fear without anxiety, like, fear without anxiety is funner than fear with anxiety. Because it's like, go to a scary movie or something, it's not exactly you're anxious for the scare to happen. You're just experiencing that shock with none of the repercussions afterwards. I like the idea of being afraid without being worried. That's what I want. I don't, what I really don't want is to be worried, which is what I am all the time. I don't want to be afraid either. I just want to be quiet and content and watching The Good Place on Netflix. Yeah. Scientists describe both surprise and fear as wide-eyed information gathering facial expressions. <laughs> I want to stop do that and just like have yeah. a relaxed facial expression. I'd rather not gather any more information. Yeah, I've got for a little while, please. <laughs> Well, I guess now that we've agreed on what frightens us, let's take a tour of this mansion and some of the creepiest sounds it contains. Our first stop is the conservatory to explore classically horrifying nature sounds. Watch your step for that creaking floorboard and Sam's pet rat. So natural sounds are this 
classic horror thing, like howls of wolves or scurrying feet or like creaking and you don't know where it's coming from. And they're rooted in the fact that humans fear the unknown, basically the question of whether there's something dangerous or not. And in evolutionary psychology, there's this idea called agent detection mechanisms, which basically says that if you have a rustle in the bushes or you see a footprint, your brain will automatically say, there is an intelligent agent there that is trying to harm you. Uh So you have this fearful gut reaction and error on the side of caution, because if you don't react when there's an actual threat, you will be dead. That makes sense to me. But also I was thinking about the scurrying thing because usually things that scurry... Like, they're not, I could take whatever it is. Yeah. If it's a mouse, if thing. it's a guinea pig, yeah. A good <laughs> stomp and you win. <laughs> but, like, I think my fear is more about the unpleasantness of the sensation of, like, if it decides to scurry onto me. It's just that mm. that experience that I'm afraid of, but I'm not necessarily afraid of, like, a physical harm. Or maybe I'm just fooling myself. Yeah, snakes make that noise when they go through the the leaf litter, yeah. and I mm. definitely don't want to. I definitely don't wanna get bitten by a snake because uh, that really can be the end. Yeah. Also, I think that there are a lot of animals that make pretty. They don't make a ton of noise. Like a mountain lion doesn't make a ton of noise when it's coming up on you. And it can make a little noise, and you could definitely be like, "There is an intelligent agent that sees my ham hock as a ham hock." <laughs> so. Non-human animals are natural sounds, but also human screams, I feel like, fit into this category Mm -hmm. where there's a specific psychological response to hearing this kind of sound. And screams are actually not super well studied by neuroscientists and psychologists, but they have a very clear definition of them. It is a communication signal used for survival that's virtually universal, and it's loud high pitch and have these fluctuations called roughness, which are unique to screams. So a yell or raising your voice or like singing a loud note doesn't generally have this roughness. And that roughness equates to more fearful sounding screams mm. in psychological studies. So basically that we, we, we figured out a, a noise no one else makes. Mm-hmm. And we were like, that one will be the one that we will assign to something terrible is happening to me. Run away. <laughs> <laughs> our second stop will be the library with our grand piano and Stefan's other musical instruments. Since we've had music, there have been melodies that send shivers down our spines. Evolutionarily speaking, and this is related to yelps or screams, harsh or non-linear sounds are more stressful because they possibly are interpreted by our brains similarly to like human screams. It reminds me of like the roughness quality. Both humans and many non-human animals respond to sounds with background noise and abrupt frequency changes in similar stressful ways because those sorts of sounds are produced when vocal folds are overused in like surprise or shouting situations. So it's possible that if, like, music is ultimately just a sequence of sounds, if those sounds are more divorced from emotion and just, like, sound like the franticness of whatever communication an animal uses, then that is why it can be scary. Do we understand why music invokes any kind of response, no matter what kind of response it is? It's never made any sense to me. It's like, here, have a noise. And your brain is like, yeah. That's a nice noise. (laughs) I like that one. (laughs) I feel like it's trained a lot of it, that we just (laughs) grow up in a system and are exposed to certain things and we learn to associate them with good experiences. There has to be a way to do that research. There's got to be people who who haven't heard any of like the music that, that I hear. And we can be like, Here's a song that Hank thinks is a happy song. Do you think it's a happy song? <laughs> we did those experiments on the Chimani people in Bolivia, uh, in the Amazon, and they are not, they have not been exposed to uh, Western music, or, or at least are not, didn't grow up with it the way that we did. And mm-hmm. to them, like we hear 
major scales and chords as a happier sound, and Mm -hmm. we interpret minor chords or scales or dissonance as like a sadder or scarier sound. But to them, they could differentiate between the two, but they didn't label them the same way. They didn't find it unpleasant the way that we do. It was just like, this is a different quality that sound can or music can be, but it's not necessarily worse or negative. And it could be that there are some innate qualities to it, but also some learned qualities to it. Right. I don't know. This gets into like epigenetics, which I'm very much not an expert in, but because we have generations and generations of people mm. saying here is the same good sounding music than when you have a baby. You think I, we have... <laughs> epigenetic music tastes that would be wild i got some methylated chromosome somewhere being like you're gonna like elton john (laughs) (laughs) stefan have you ever heard of like the devil's interval oh yeah yeah you have to use that (laughs) if you want to be cool so if there are two notes that are seven semitones apart that's like i feel like that's one of the strongest intervals that you can have that's like a perfect fifth and the, the devil's interval is like one semitone short of that. It's six semitones apart. Oh, and for some reason, chilling. it just sounds evil. Or really cool if you use it correctly. This is Halloween, Stefan. Yeah, it's so all evil. evil. It's got to be evil. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and our last stop is the laboratory. This is where us scientists hang out, and it's where Hank conducts his definitely safe experiments with extreme high and low pitches on any unsuspecting passersby. Some of these sounds occur naturally, but it makes sense to lump them together because this is the realm where we are artificially generating sound and using a lot of technology to help us analyze exactly what they do. But to start with high pitch sounds, They can be viscerally unpleasant if you know the trope of the nails on a chalkboard, but we're not quite sure why. In Spain, there's a word grima for this this visceral sound like styrofoam rubbing against each other or a knife scratching on a plate that gives you like a physical unpleasant sensation or repulsion beyond just not enjoying the sound. And when these types of sounds were played, then there is a, there's a physiological change in heart rate that is slightly different from being shown or from hearing disgusting things. Mm. And a 2006 Ig Nobel Prize found frequencies in the middle of the audio range when scratching a three-pronged garden rake on a chalkboard no. were the worst. <laughs> it sounds really bad. <laughs> but what was interesting, it wasn't it wasn't like the highest pitched frequencies, like right on the oh. edge of our hearing that made people oh. the most uncomfortable with it. It was like the combination of all that. Right. They hypothesized and it's an ignoble, so take a grain of salt. But they said it was the range where our ear canal resonates, so maybe it causes a stronger mm. response in your huh. brain. I yeah. have heard that, because you mentioned that our brains might be tuned to those those frequencies in the middle that are like more for like a scream. And I've heard that our ear shape also reinforces those frequencies. It's like, this is where a baby's scream is centered. And so Mm -hmm. it's like just useful to be able to hear those more clearly, I guess. Speaking of vibrations, that's a good transition into the low sounds that creep us out. Mm. So for example, infrasound, which is anything generally under 20 Hertz, below the frequencies of audible sounds to human ears. In nature, things like volcanoes or avalanches or earthquakes and some animal sounds, but also human made things like nuclear tests or explosions can generate infrasound. You mostly feel this as vibrations if it's loud enough, Mm -hmm. but your ear can't recognize it as like a particular tone. And that's the thing that can make you think you see ghosts, right? Yeah. So acoustic scientists in 2003 played around 750 concert goers live music, including some laced with infrasound. And 22% of them reported more unusual experiences. So like uneasy deep sadness, revulsion, <laughs> and fear when infrasound oh, no. was played in the music. Oh, and it's also like similar symptoms have been reported 
in a supposedly haunted laboratory Mm. or in cathedrals or castles where people have felt the presence of a ghost and people have gone back with sound detecting equipment and found infrasound at around 19 hertz. So you're saying people can't hear, you can't hear it, but it does make you sad. Yeah. <laughs> is there a sound that I can't hear but makes me happy? I would guess not. <laughs> That's not allowed. <laughs> why, why, why does it only make people sad? Why can't we have a, a happy silent noise? I think my, so, okay, my theory is that it's just, it's something that's outside of our n- everyday experience. Yeah. And so it's just unsettling. Like there's, it's part of that, like tapping into the unknown. Like we we don't know what's happening and we have this sensation that we can't describe or can't make sense of given our everyday experience. And so it's just like, well, I'm scared now or I'm going (laughs) to poop my pants, which is there's that the theoretical like brown note, which is like the infrasound note that will make people poop. (laughs) <laughs> it's not that scary, I guess, but... <laughs> That's so <terrifying. laughs> scary. Yeah. That could be used for all kinds of ill intent. Yeah. Don't well, give yeah, that yeah. power. Curing people who are constipated. This is medical marvel. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it looks like the storm has passed and you're probably anxious to be on your way. I hope you found all our twists and turns and trivia welcoming. If you liked what you heard, leave us a review, tell other people to pay us a visit, or send a raven to that loud bird website with your favorite moment. We might go on other mini adventures if you enjoyed this one. Thank you for joining us. I have been Sari Riley. I have been Sam Schultz. I've been Stefan Chin. And I've been Hank Green. (laughs) Ooh, that was scariest part of the whole thing so far. It was very unsettling. SciShow Tangents is a co-production of Complexly and the wickedly wonderful team at WNYC Studios. It's created by all of us and produced by Caitlin Hoffmeister and Sam Schultz, who edits a lot of these episodes along with Hiroko Matsushima. Our scary social media organizer is Paula Garcia Prieto. Our eerie editorial assistant is Deboki Chakravarti. Our sinister sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. And we couldn't make any of this without our putrid patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a coffin to be filled, but a jackal lantern to be lighted. Happy Halloween! But, one more thing. So being afraid of making embarrassing sounds like farting is totally normal. But one study published in March 2018 had volunteers watch different clips, like a gas relief ad with a woman (laughs) farting in yoga class or one with a person farting in front of their crush at a party. And when they concentrated on feeling like the person doing the farting, they got self-conscious, deeply embarrassed. But when they concentrated on being an outside observer, they reported feeling less embarrassed. So if you ever feel a deep fear of your own fart, Just, like, pretend to be someone else, and it'll be fine. (laughs) Seems like iffy advice. You think people should just let him rip, huh? Yeah, just let it rip. Yeah, it's so natural. Well, I don't think people should be farting, and I've never farted, and I won't ever. So... (laughs)